Okay. In room number two, we will have uh, your perfect news team for success. And here we are ready to start with two stack CMS presented by the brain. Please welcome on stage Christopher Lubeck. In uh, 1989, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web. It should change the world, how we communicate and perceive information. You surely know all that, but a little known fact is that the very first web browser, also called World Wide Web as a coincidence, was more than you might think. It was a simple viewer, but it was also an editor. And it has a complete Visivic experience like we have today and even included handling of links and linking to documents. And this was the very essence of hypertext. And that's a, that is a screenshot. And while it's not comparable in features to a modern CMS, and it was more a single user um, CMS, if you could call that, it was nevertheless no small feature for that time. And that was made possible because of Next and NextOS, which had all the foundations we also have in macOS today. So very cool to look back at that. And th the first website was served from files by that very computer from Tim Berners-Lee, which is still situated at CERN. And in 1993, the web became public domain, which was a great decision, and adoption really exploded, as we all know. And soon browsers got um, developed further, and uh, even less powerful systems than a next um, computer um, got a browser like line mode browser you see here. It's actually a nice experiment you can try yourself on the CERN website. And um, with Netscape and Mosaic, um, the browser was on its way to becoming like we know it today. Um, so, as a coincidence, you can still look at that very first website with a modern browser. And um, it's not served from the original machine, of course, but it's still the same files. It's, it's really ugly hypertext, no HTML at all. And on the other hand, there's no way for you to, to start that original browser. I tried and to find information that it's, it's really impossible to, to emulate in Next, and you have really have to own the art hardware, which is quite expensive to get. By. And um, I thought that's funny. Let's do a thought experiment. If the original first website was not served from static files, but by a CMS like we know it today, we wouldn't be able to access it at all. It, it would be impossible to get the, the software of that time running on some modern hardware. So um, I, I thought that's funny. And um, while looking back, um, let's think about why does that matter at all. And I want to show you some alternatives to the CMS design we know. And two-stack CMS is one architecture where I will explain why and when you might need it and um, to see how a production-ready implementation could look like with NEOS. But let's first uh, start a little bit uh, by, by looking into how we got into that situation. Um, so, the advent of the CMS. Um, as scripting languages for the web and the LAMP stack got traction, um, you really could start to do all kinds of things using the web but uh, not on the browser with a client-side implementation like you would do it today, but more on the server by using all kinds of, of features of PHP and other script language or uh, dynamic languages on the brow browser. Um, so it's no coincidence that most web uh, CMS emerged in the early 2000s and were built around a very server-centric architecture where all kind of logic was put into the server. And every feature really was part of that server and um, which resulted in a huge software as we have a legacy in most modern or most known CMS like Type 3, Drupal, you name it. It's uh, maybe NEOS is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, so that's called a majestic monolith. Um, it looks quite beautiful on the picture and there's a nice article from DHH from, from uh, the Ruby and Rails uh, developer about that, but um, it, it's 
th this architecture of having a monolith is is not bad per se. It has a lot of um, simplicity if it's well done, and uh, it's still the dominant architecture of many CMS and web-based systems. But let's have a look inside to understand what's going on and and why that might be a problem in certain cases if you deploy a CMS and have more demanding requirements. So we roughly have the following architecture. Um, we have in most CMS a backend and front end, um, more or less separated, depends on the system. And um, in NEOS, for example, the backend is a separate UI, but it shows you the front end to do what we like about NEOS, the front end editing. And for example, in WordPress or other systems, there's a clear separation. The backend looks totally different than the front end. It's it also on the code level, it is separated. And um, but most of the systems, especially in a CMS world, use PHP, a web server, which handles the requests originally, and finally a database and file system for persistence. Um, I think you all know that um, basically. And um, so front end and back end, even if separated, are really coupled inside a system on a single persistence most of the time. Well, let's see, how, how is a site you request them, um, how do you see a result? Um, so y a user browses uh, to the CMS with a URL and it goes through the web server, then through some dynamic layer which calls into the code, in this case the front end part, um, it will look up in the database, is there a post or a document or however that is done in that pa uh, particular CMS. But in the end, it will resolve something. Maybe there's a cache that skips ca some of these lookups and makes it faster for subsequent requests. But um, my point is here, rendering of a response is always driven by the front end and uh, only by the user accessing the site. So it's some kind of implicit or lazy rendering that is uh, really important to keep in mind. So. What's wrong with that? Um, so the monolithic architecture seems to work well because many CMS use it, right? And um, But what happens Im if some part of that monolith breaks or is getting um, inresponsive? Um, this is what your visipos visitors might get, um, which is not so good. Or even worse, if your system got hacked. And um, so you really don't want that to happen. So let's have a look at some non-functional requirements many software systems uh, have and that are part of, um, of the architecture. Um, let's first talk about availability. So you know these nines, four nines, um, and what does that mean actually? So if you have a service level agreement on how responsive your uh, software or your service should be or has to be. Um, this is given as a minimum availability in percent and the four nodes denote a maximum unavailable service under 0.01% in a specific time span, average 24 seven or something. So a day has 86,400 uh, seconds. And if, y if you do the multiplication, you get roughly 8.6 seconds per day, which is really not much. And that's under five minutes per month of downtime for doing stuff where your site has to be down. And even in one year, you are well below one hour. So what does that mean? When, when is our CMS not available? Or the front end for, for visitors. So you have to do updates of your CMS and also of plugins, extensions, and packages. Uh, if you have a zero downtime deployment in place, you're lucky, but often you don't. And um, even then it, it can be a little bit hard to get, get working. And what about the software of your server? And how long do, do these updates uh, take? And an update might fail. Can you do a rollback? quickly to, to uh, the previous version also after performing migrations. So I think most of us do not reach this availability with the average CMS installation. And sometimes we don't have to. Um, and there are some workarounds. So for example, some established techniques like reverse proxies and caches 
um, can mitigate the short time span of outage. And depending on the availability requirements, um, the outage of the CMS can be compensated for some time. And you can also invest in a high availability setup or book someone who already did and uh, have load balancing, a clustered database, multiple CMS instances, blue-green deployment, horizontal auto-scaling, whatever you name it. It's about it's a whole bunch of techniques and things to get right and it's by no means simple. And even then there's more to it. So security. In January 1993 only 50 websites existed and the web was a peaceful place. But nowadays everything put into the internet is under constant attack. So there are two interesting things um, can happen to everyone. and. In October 2014, the Drupal project had the following public announcement. Well, it, if it wasn't updated seven hours after the announcement, you should be prepared that your website was compromised. Um, and even with auto-updates, like in WordPress, bad things can happen. If you had heard that some minor update broke the auto-update for some people hosting a WordPress website and relying that everything will work out, it got an auto update. Well, um, at least you have to do a manual update and then every sh everything should be okay. But I think there will be a tons of instances running that previous version would never get updated. So even though the figures of um, hacked systems and systems spreading malware are uh, a little bit, uh, have a little bit declined and uh, according to the safe browsing project from Google, um, there's still a lot of sites use, uh, being used to, to drive malware or lure visitors into phishing and um, you shouldn't feel completely safe if you don't use one of the major CMS which of course got the most uh, attacks and um, exploits going around but um, every CMS has a very large attack surface which can o which offers a lot of potential vulnerabilities for attackers so um, the best advice for an attack surface reduction is to reduce the amount of code and uh, thus features that can be executed by the system it's really that simple and especially if entry points to the features are openly accessible via the internet which most CMS um, do which is kind of their job and even if the core of your CMS is pretty secure and updated in a professional manner w what about all these plugins extensions packages that provide all the nice features you're used to have and a large number of vulnerabilities come from these additions to the core um, that are added in various ways so which brings us more back to the architecture how is logic and functionality added to a monolithic architecture um, so a typical requirement for a website is to provide some kind of dynamic content for users, for example, based on a login or access restrictions. And this can go as far as having a full e-commerce implementation on top of a CMS, which sometimes is not a good idea. And you all know that there are c some extension points in the core, um, are uh, which will get part of the monolithic architecture by the core calling into the code that your extension provides um, so it can extend the behavior of the system so that also means the core of the CMS with the extension points and your uh, additional code is highly coupled if something changes in the CMS regarding that extensions and plugins will no longer work and that happens a lot of times and um, which leads to a substantial risk and change for these systems for new major updates and it also broadens the the attack surface because even more code is executed than all the code in the core and yeah we have ex experienced situations i don't know about you where we evaluated existing systems with a lot of custom functionality not developed by us uh, sometimes and was not feasible to perform an update to an up-to-date version of a cms um, at least in time and budget for the customer and which is kind of a dilemma with the security situation we have at hand and I think that happens uh, more often than we think so let's talk about how we can go towards a decoupled architecture and if that can help us 
So many of these points can be mitigated by some clever approaches. And there are many successful sites that just working with that, um, or with or with around the monolithic architecture. Um, but I think we can do better. And depending on the project requirements, we sometimes even have to. So let's see how a typical web CMS is mostly used. And um, we can identify two main roles here using the systems. We have on the one side editors creating and updating content, and on the other side visitors browsing the site. And these uh, roles are really related to how data is accessed in the systems. Um, for example, the editor is writing and the visitor is mostly reading. Um, and faced with a project that had a high availability and traffic needs um, for a global marketing site, uh, Martin Fowler coined the term two-stack CMS in 2014. And this is really based about the editing publishing uh, separation pattern. And um, it's called two-stack. Uh, the idea is the creation stack has very few editors that perform frequent updates to a site. And the delivery stack has many visitors that read content and the, the delivery stack is less often updated until a, a new content release is uh, published to the visitors. And there has to be some kind of mechanism by which editors can publish a snapshot of the content to the delivery stack and where it can then finally be delivered to the browser of a visitor or in whatever format. Um, that's basically the idea. So we have a separation of requirements. And by using the separation of requirements and concerns at the foundation of the CMS architecture, um, each stack can be optimized for the task at hand. And we have two distinct stacks um, where we can formulate, for example, different availability requirements and also different security non-functional requirements. For example, the uptime requirement for creation is typically around the working time of your editors. And for the delivery of a global uh, website, there's never a good time for it to have a downtime. So you ha typically have a much higher availability requirement. And so we can take these requirements and put them into an infrastructure that is able to fulfill it. Um, basically, we have creation and delivery to, to fill. And to, to reach the availability requirements, we might even have uh, multiple delivery uh, systems in place to, to uh, provide us scaling and availability. And we can as well um, have uh, the security requirements in place by drawing a boundary between creation and delivery and um, to, to make sure the creation stack is not reachable publicly. And that will reduce the attack surface and, um, and make it much smaller because typically a delivery stack can be implemented with la much less code. And um, even with a more safe language by default, for example, with Go, Rust, JVM, whatever, you can also use PHP, no problem. Um, the two-stack architecture gives us uh, some additional ways to think about responsibilities. And um, it gives us ways to think about where to put knowledge and logic and where additional features belong in that architecture. And let's, let's have a look at some examples. For example, login and restricted access. This has to be done in the delivery layer and not in the creation stack. And if you have variations of your content based on some request condition on the type of customer looking at the site, then this becomes easy in the delivery part. And for example, integrating third-party systems for creation like a product information management system, digital as asset management that naturally fits into the part of the creation stack or even multiple CMS. It's this architecture is not only meant for a single CMS. And if you have third-party systems with interactive content, then that can be integrated on the delivery stack. Um, I show later what uh, the possible options are. And if you have additional content features, it can be additional features on the creation stack and will it will not uh, grow your attack surface on the delivery stack. So let's have a look how that can be implemented with NEOS. Uh, 
to start with that, we need to answer a few design questions because you have many possibilities to implement such an architecture. So first question, where do we place NEOs? Uh, we have two stacks and I think it's pretty obvious th that NEOs belongs in the cre content creation stack. Um, so the NEOs backend has to be reachable or has to be put into the content creation stack. And we, we also want to offer the great user experience of NEOs and keep it as much as um, possible um, also in the two-stack architecture. So most of the editing is done in the front-end editing mode, which gives a good preview of the final result. And we need to be able to pr provide a more or less complete output of the site also in the NEOs backend because that is really used inside the backend. Um, and NEOS uh, relies on a few enhancements of the site being rendered in the front end, inside the back end, and uh, to enable inline editing and other stuff around the content with metadata. And it would be very cumbersome to, to separate this and uh, put the whole front end rendering also in the delivery stack. And it is also against having uh, the idea of having few writes on the delivery side because c editors will constantly update your content. So that means we have to include uh, the rendering part of our site as a part of the creation stack and place NEOs in the creation stack. Then the next question, how should we exchange content with the delivery stack? Um, we also need a result of the rendering in the delivery stack to d deliver the final version with the HTML to our visitors. Um, there are really a number of ways to go there, and I have seen uh, different of them applied in practice. Um, you either duplicate parts of the rendering and have both at the, at the creation site for editing previews and exchange content as structured data with the delivery stack, and there you need a, a similar but not completely the same rendering to, uh, to transform your structured data into the final response. And of course you have to duplicate rendering. Maybe you can use the same engine, then it becomes feasible. Um, having structured data in the content store is a nice benefit, but well, depends. Um, or you exchange the rendered results and render snippets or some kind of output into the content store, uh, maybe with a few adjustments for public delivery, so you can render content a little bit different in the back end and for the final um, publishing in the content store. And we can keep the knowledge about how to render content um, on the creation stack, so we can have a better enca encapsulation and we, have kinda, uh, we, we can have a much smaller delivery stack, which is uh, really a benefit here. So we took that decision uh, when implementing that, and let's look at the next question. Um, what granularity do we need for rendered content? Um, where granular granularity means um, whether we want to store the full results of a rendered document based on a URL, or if we want to have some smaller size of snippets on that document and assemble them later in the delivery layer. This question is harder to reason about, depends on your requirements and what you want to achieve. And um, storing complete results is a reasonable idea and you could even publish static files for each document in the system with a complete HTTP message, including status code headers that's already built in in NEOS to, to provide in the front end output. And it would look like this, um, but also a smaller granularity could be advantages. For example, full publishing of a uh, site um, could take quite some time with thousands of URLs. But in many situations, all a only a smaller part of the website was edited and would need to be republished. So I would consider it a full publishing or an incremental publishing uh, where we have to think about. So before settling for a decision here, let's see how we can store the content inside the content store. And for storage of rendered content, um, we, uh, um, we should be able to replicate it to the delivery site, and um, we have to do a lookup for rendered content by URL to find 
the, the matching content for a request. And it, it should be very fast, of course, in that case. One other nice thing to have would be immutable deployments where we can uh, publish content once and it would never change until and each new publishing would create a new release. That's always a good idea to have. And if we then can have an, an atomic switch to a new version, we have really a zero downtime and rollback possibility on the content um, layer. And there are many choices for persistent storage and um, it depends on the requirements of your architecture, but we chose to use Redis because it's easy to b deploy a lightweight uh, solution and it can implement all of our requirements. It's an in-memory data structure store. I think many of you might know it already. And um, it can give access to our data in constant times, has a reliable replication mechanism, and it even can be used as a job queue, which we need for this publishing to get really going in the background. And um, these were all cases speaking for Redis. And um, we settled for a decision to use or to, to enable incremental publishing, having a smaller granularity for the rendered content. And yeah, let's see what we actually store. Um, so Neos has a content cache. Many of you might know it or had trouble with it, getting it configured correctly. And it stores parts of the rendered output. If, um, I stay on that slide. So if, if some subsequent requests want to render the same part of a site with the same input node or other things, um, it, it can be retrieved from the cache, uh, from the cache to, to get a pre-rendered part of that cache segment, which fits uh, to the idea of having rendered snippets. So caching is built around the concepts of identifiers. I only put the first four characters here. And um, these uniquely identify cache segments and tags, which you see in the blue boxes. And um, these tags tell the system when a, si uh, when a segment should be invalidated. And this can happen if a node or any other data in the system changes. Um, NEOS will flush all kinds of tags based on that particular node, and it might hit an existing segment which is flushed. And this means it should be rendered on the next request. So another request comes in for that node, maybe a menu was rendered, then that menu will get rendered again. Um, so these segments can be nested in the content cache. So you see these are structured and can have arbitrary nesting. And these end up as placeholders in the content, um, mainly because we want to have different tagging on different levels. So not to completely um, flush a, an output of one document only if one other document was added in the system and in a menu need to needed to be flushed. So actually the system provides all of the building blocks we need um, to assemble a final result starting from an identifier. We can go through the content cache and assemble a complete output on the delivery layer. We just need to add a small mapping from identifier to a URL URL path. We used URLs because it was a multi-site, uh, it is a multi-site project where we need to store rendered results for many sites. And we can also employ the cache invalidation part of the system to use for our incremental rendering. And this is nice because it allows you to, to leverage the same entry tags integrators know in NEOS and already use to have a correct definition of the rendering. Um, one issue though is that the content uh, cache is built around the concept of that lazy rendering or um, implicit rendering. It, it is not possible uh, to tell which segments need to be re-rendered if changes to the content occurred. And besides our ma mapping from URL to root identifier, um, the segment identifiers have no meaning. These are just hashes of something. So just at looking at these cache segments, we cannot tell anything about that. So it turns out we can work around that by checking the whole cache structure for holes and find the root cache segments where that originated and introduce two mappings, one from the 
identifier to a URL and one from a URL to the identifier. And this gives us a way to start a fresh rendering once we know which cache entries um, have somehow holes because something inside that was flushed. And luckily Redis had the po has the pol possibility to evaluate Lua scripts, which is a small scripting language, and these are directly executed in the data store. That's a very fast way to implement logic and just return the data you actually need. Yeah. And I would not take the same approach next time, but we, we settled on reusing the same cache structure in Redis and copying it to the content cache. And we do that also by atomically copying it with the Lua script and um, using Redis hashes for that. So that's a view in Redis at the content cache, like you get in a default NEOS installation if you use the uh, Redis cache backend. And this is how we store it as a content release inside the content store. You see the release identifier and having multiple of these. And it holds all the cache data and some meta information, including the mappings we need from URL to identifiers and back, if errors are, uh, occurred during rendering and else. So, yeah. When and how should we publish to the content store? Um, we chose to start um, an incremental publishing automatically when an editor publishes to the live workspace. Um, but using a flow command or using the content module um, we wrote for that, you can also start a new full publishing. So that's the content module. And um, depending on this uh, content store module, and depending on the size of the site and how many URLs you need to reevaluate on depending on a change, the publishing can take quite a uh, quite some time with a few minutes. Um, so it has to run in the in the background with the job queue, like I already said. And you can employ the same Redis instance. You can use any other job queue implementation from the flow pack job queue common package. <coughs> ah, sorry which uh, provides you all kinds of robust methods to, to run longer running jobs in the background. So this is how it, how it looks. Um, it's a basic um, interface which shows which URLs are rendered, which uh, were already in the store. If errors occurred, this is all fine. This is an incremental rendering. Only seven URLs of 89 were re-rendered. And um, turns out you need some kind of insight into that uh, content store to, 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 to see what's going on and to debug stuff. Um, there's also a ton of logging in log files um, to, to turn on if, if you need that. So <coughs> let's have a look. How do we actually trigger the rendering? Um, there are two possible approaches of rendering document nodes, and one is totally default going over HTTP like any visitor. And this has the benefit of really working out of the box without any changes or without being different from how your normal content would be served. Um, downside is you have a certain need a server running near us. It has to be reach reachable from itself with the same name or it, it can be hard for multi-site installations depending on your infrastructure. And Another drawback is um, that for each node variant involving content dimensions and stuff, um, it must be rendered through a single request per variant, which can get slow. So the other approach is to use a rendering via CLI and without using the web server at all. And this allows us to batch, batch a bunch of node variants and um, do that in one job in the job queue. So that's much faster than doing that for each variant. And th this speeds up rendering considerably. And that's also what we decided for um, or implemented in the second iteration of that system. So looks like we have most pieces in place, but how to deliver the rendered content? So this is the most individual part and it depends on your requirements and your infrastructure needs. And 
it's really a basic server to have these responses in the delivery layer from the content store. Um, it can be implemented in a few hours in almost any language if it has Redis and HTTP capabilities. And in our project, we implemented the front end using Java because that was a requirement using Spring Boot. But you can use any language and framework that suits you best and is best for the task at hand. And that's actually, I think, one of the biggest benefits of the two-stack architecture, um, to have the full freedom on that la layer, have very little coupling between the creation stack and the delivery stack. Um, and you can use what you are comfortable with and what is best for the project. So um, that means we have to use rendering at the creation stack. No, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so the delivery stack um, could be Java, PHP, Go, whatever. And um, one question um, still is uh, here, um, how, to, how can we implement dyma dynamic elements? Because what we now have in place is not much more than having a static site export running um, because all the content is static once it's inside the content store. And when, when you have NEOs um, running um, directly, you have things like forms and plugins that process user data, a login, front-end user login, but that's not possible anymore. Um, and there's also a restriction to only use fully cached segments in NEOs, so you can't have anything uncached because that's po not possible to evaluate once a visitor goes to the delivery stack. So um, there are multiple solutions here. Um, one is a little bit more modern, that's called gem stack, which is in itself a stack pattern. Or, and the idea is to have everything static and perform all the logic on the client side um, with JavaScript and APIs. And um, another solution is to implement this on top of the custom delivery layer and have like form posts or everything handled by the delivery layer. And, but then you have to integrate that with your content, which is kind of a pack because, because only Neos knows what content and how it should be rendered. And, but it depends. That's uh, also a good fit um, to integrate external services and APIs directly in the delivery layer. And we ended up using both concepts. So server-side handling in the front end handles um, conditional content, access restrictions. We use stateless sessions there with uh, JWT. And we also have a simple mechanism for, simp uh, for content replacements of placeholders and blocks of conditional contents. If that holds display content A, if that holds display content B, and this is all visible in the NEOS backend. If you place a widget, it just um, returns some, some markup, which is then executed on the client, of course. And all the widget implementation is done in JavaScript, yeah. accessing a REST API of on the delivery layer, which calls into various um, existing services, and um, which is a nice integration pattern. Yeah, it's time for a demo, just in time. Um, yeah, I, I uh, quickly uh, integrated that yesterday with the NEOS demo site, and it, it worked out even after, s after the social event. Um, and turns out you can write the simple delivery, it is a very simple delivery implementation in, in a under uh, an hour. Um, and yeah, I want to show how that works. Oh. <laughs> to get this monitor working. Ah. Too many screens. Sorry, I didn't try that here. So just there. Okay, so. 
I hope you can now see it. Yeah. Okay, so that's the content storm module. And I have to re-log in. So, like I said, vanilla Neos demo installation with the demo site. Um, I installed that content store package, which is not yet open source. We are talking about that and um, maybe uh, being able to open source that like it is. And here you see all publishings that are that were done, and um, you can just work normally in the back end. We have a uh, job queue running th uh, through a flow command which processes these jobs and we have a delivery running I think that's the PHP version I also wrote a Go version quickly um, and just to see it's really possible to do that in a lot of languages and um, if I change some content, let's use that. I publish, let's quickly go to the content store. Uh, it's already done. Um, there was a new release. We see some, some jobs were executed um, to, to start a new content release, render the nodes, finally switch to the new content release. And um, that's all done in the background. If I access the site, as you see there's a small bug there. I didn't figure that out. The, the root site is not working in PHP. <laughs> well, so that's our website running through the delivery layer. It's really not fancy because it looks the same like if you would access access it over Neos directly. But we see, um, for example, on this page we have some, some cache placeholder which is just not supported because we cannot place anything which I, I placed that here to see that there's something going on. You mostly want to, to get rid of that if, if one part of Neos still um, adds some, some non-cacheable segment to the output but well it works it's it's blazingly fast of course um it's it's easy to republish i can click on yeah publish all again we have a progress bar it's you can reload the page it's it's not fancy at all but it, it it's helpful <laughs> and yeah now it's done it, it republished everything and yeah I, it works so Oh, the, the Go version again <coughs> looks the same. That's the running with Go. Yeah. <coughs> That's the demo. And yeah, I, I think you can, I, I didn't include something dynamic in the demo. It really depends on what you need to do. Um, like I said, Jamstack or going through with an API and including that, you have all the freedom on that side. So, a conclusion. Um, the architecture worked uh, pretty well, and um, this is really very flexible. It adds some more moving things to your setup, of course. Um, debugging, it, it's a concurrent system. Debugging can be harder. Um, getting a full publishing running is pretty easy. Um, from Neos, getting the incremental publishing running reliably with content dimensions and everything is pretty hard to get all the small features right. And since um, we want to do the next project with a, a similar architecture, we are thinking about how we can make some stuff more explicit. And if we shouldn't use like a um, introduce a, s a separate service that r that drives the rendering and um, uh, that knows about the current state and what content needs to be re-rendered and stuff like that. So um, it's not finished. We we just have a sketch of the architecture and are starting with a proof of concept soon. But um, yeah, it will be interesting. Yeah, thank you for listening. <laughs>